Good afternoon, and welcome back to day one of International Programs International Symposium. My name is Kevin Noe, and it's my pleasure this afternoon to welcome you to the session, The Language of Joy. Our two presenters today are Maria Ines Canto and Jonathan Carlion. Maria is an assistant professor of Spanish, and Jonathan is an associate professor of Spanish, both here at CSU. Before we get started, I would like to remind all of our attendees that the Q&A feature is active down below. So if you do have any questions throughout the session, please be sure to type them in there. Additionally, closed captioning is available. Please select at the bottom of your screen if you'd like to utilize that feature. And finally, at the end of our session today, there will be a short survey. And if you are able to complete it, we would very much appreciate that. So now we will turn to the language of joy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kevin. Um, Maria Ines and I divided this up into two parts. So she's allowed me to, to go first and I'm just gonna um, present a couple of ideas and I'll turn it over to you, Maria Ines. Um, <clears throat> my talk is also on the joy of language as you can imagine. And I'm gonna refer to uh, someone named Araya Smith. Arias Smith lived in Manhattan his entire life, and like nearly 80% of the U.S. population, he grew up speaking English only. And it was not until he started studying Chinese language and culture at Hunter College that he discovered the joy that learning another language can bring to one's life. In fact, after Hunter College, Araya moved to Beijing, where he enrolled in an intensive language immersion program. He is currently 31 years old, and his Chinese has only gotten better. He's also worth nearly $1 million. He has earned his fortune as a YouTube content creator while his videos, and while his videos may come across as a little bit awkward, Araya's channel, which is called Geoma NYC, has 4.5 million subscribers. What seems to attract the attention of millions of viewers around the world seems to be, as Araya puts it, that a clueless white guy can order a meal in perfect Chinese. Those are his words. His most popular video, in fact, is titled, quote, Clueless White Guy Orders in Perfect Chinese. This video has over 73 million views and may have been what led to a sponsorship from the company Skillshare. However, the other videos in which he shocks native speakers with his proficiency in Chinese are equally popular. He, his white guy orders takeout in perfect Chinese, has 43 million views, and his clueless American tourist busts out perfect Chinese, has 18 million views. What explains the shock value of these videos? Allow me to share a 30 second clip of his most popular video. And please know I'm not presenting this out of admiration necessarily, but merely as a data point for my upcoming conversation. So here's the first clip. So that's the first video. I'm going to stop sharing for a moment. And notice how the subtitle translations, you may have noticed this, but those subtitle translations serve as counterpoint to the language being spoken, uh, English subtitling for Chinese, Chinese subtitling for English. Araya certainly has an international audience. But again, in a country like the US, where only 22% of the citizens speak a second language, it is apparently a shock in and of itself that any international tourist from the US might speak anything other than English, much less be able to impress native speakers with their proficiency level. Some statistics, only 20% of US K through 12 students study a non-English language and a dismal 7.5% of college level students across the US take a second language. 
One would think that students do not care about languages. However, if you look at any number of popular movies, you will notice that the ability to speak multiple languages is often a highlight. One such example that caught my attention recently was from Denis Villeneuve's 2021 remake of the movie Dune. The film grossed nearly $400 million and received 10 Oscar nominations. For purposes of this presentation, I have one additional clip to present to you. It's the last one. It's 40 seconds. And I will ask you that while watching, please count how many languages are spoken. Also, please excuse the quality of this clip. I had to film it using my iPhone to record the computer screen. And I'm using the clip solely for educational purposes. Again, count the number of languages you notice. Why is Dr. Yue here? He only needs a moment. Hello, young master. Your mother asked me to check your vitals. His heart is strong as ever, that lady. Okay, thank you. So English, of course, is spoken. However, the French Canadian director went to lengths to focus on non-English languages as well. For example, Timothy Chalamet's character meets, when, when Timothy Chalamet's character meets Dr. Yue, we hear Mandarin spoken between doctor and patient. Then when the medical checkup is over, Lady Jessica uses sign language, albeit one specifically created for the movie. Most importantly for this discussion, in under one minute, we are exposed to three language systems. The first point I wish to make here, although more and more colleges have dropped languages programs around the US, especially during the pandemic, the millions of views garnered by the clueless white guy and the multiple languages used in popular movies suggest that non-English languages are exciting. I will say in passing that CSU students are examples of this excitement. The Department of Languages, Literacy and Cultures has nearly 800 students enrolled in our programs from every college at CSU and representing over 50 majors. CSU students major, double major and minor with us because they love learning new languages. Perhaps they recognize how the ability to speak these languages brings joy. Indeed, if we return to Araya's YouTube video, the smiles of the various people's faces all provide testimony to this joy. This brings me to a second point. Multilingualism is a cornerstone of US domestic culture. We may be tempted to think this video is being recorded in Beijing. That is to say, the white, boy, the white man uh, orders Chinese food is being recorded in Beijing. However, no, the domestic relevance of non-English language is made manifest by the fact that Araya is filming these encounters in Manhattan. For while K through 12 and colleges may not teach languages, the US is a multilingual culture, country. After English, the second most spoken US language is Spanish, which has 41 million speakers. Chinese ranks third with 3.5 million. And in Colorado, although we regularly see well, although, although we regularly see English and Spanish side by side, you may be surprised to know that from 1876 to 1990, the Colorado Constitution required laws to be published in English, Spanish, and German. The fourth most common language in the US is French with 2.1 million speakers. And on a personal note, my grandmother spoke Louisiana Cajun French. However, my dad did not because at the time it was illegal to teach French in the public schools. Luckily, in the most recent Louisiana constitution of 1974, this anti-French provision was removed. And indeed the legislators included a statement acknowledging quote, the right of the people to preserve, foster and promote their respective historic linguistic and cultural origins. Outside of Louisiana, however, French is also spoken in many parts of New England, and we need only think of Cache-Lapoudre River to recognize the influence of this non-English language in Fort Collins. Indeed, this doesn't even begin to address the rich linguistic traditions of indigenous languages in this region. 
The domestic reality of the USA is that we are a country of numerous non-English languages. By not teaching these languages, by not encouraging the learner of them in our the learning of them in our schools and universities, we are cutting ourselves off from immense cultural wealth. And we are limiting our joy because as pointed out earlier, languages bring joy to people. But some might ask, why should we learn any other language than English? Doesn't everyone speak English? Isn't it a true lingua franca, the language of commerce around the world? And not only that, won't Google Translate soon be able to render all languages universal? These questions suggest something akin to a scene out of Star Trek, where technology will allow us to speak whatever we want to be universally understood by anyone in the world. And this may in fact come to pass someday, and maybe someday soon. However, this reliance on technology may also rob us of the joy we have in learning new languages and discovering in these languages new truths about ourselves and about the cultures of the world. To borrow a phrase, these new technologies will isolate us from the means of production of non-English languages. One of the arguments of this essay is that the cost of monolingualism will outweigh any benefit. We may look to history to find an analogy. The arts and crafts movement was inspired by the writings of Pugin, Ruskin, and William Morris, who all saw the movement as a protest against industrialization. Their goal consisted of a concerted effort to put pleasure back into work by returning focus to the human dimension of craft. For example, William Morris regarded work as an essential condition of life and thought. He wrote, if a man has to work, if a man has to work, do which he despises. If a man has to do work which he despises, excuse me, which does not satisfy his natural and rightful desire for pleasure, the great part of his life must pass unhappily and without self-respect. Language is an even more fundamental condition of life. And as Janet Copeless and Brett Metcalf, Ruth Metcalf argue in their book, uh, Making a History of American Craft, the arts and craft movement was a reaction to alienation caused by industrialization. However, more than industrialization, the loss of skills associated with craft, what Coplos and Metcalf refer to as de-skilling, was, was the more likely cause of alienation than even division of labor. People no longer participated in the human dimension of craft, and this cut them off from a deep source of joy. Analogously, we may ask whether de-languaging will continue to alienate us from international culture. This is as much a policy question as it is a practices question, and it has very real implications. My access to Cajun French of my grandmother, for example, was cut off to the policies that de-languaged my father. This brings me to my last point on languages and democracy. Rosemary Salomon, in her brilliant new book, The Rise of English, Global Politics and the Power of Language, Oxford 2022, speaks to what we might refer to as the alienation from languages. Salomon mentions the idea of the Marquis de Codorcet in his 19, 1719, excuse me, 1793 treatise, The Progress of the Human Mind, Condorcet advocated for education reform and equal rights. He believed that the key to social equality was equality through the use of learning, the use and learning of language. As Solomon explains, Condorcet's concern was that Latin had held a monopoly over claims of truth until vernacular languages made sciences more popular and widely available. If Latin had continued, said Condorcet, it would have divided men into two classes, would have perpetuated in the people prejudices and errors, and would have placed an insurmountable impediment on true equality. English today may be dividing people into two classes as well, and not necessarily to the benefit of those who speak English only. No doubt it is advantageous to learn English if you want to do business, publish articles, travel the world. However, those of us who only speak English need to recognize how this limitation may be perpetuating prejudices and errors and placing impediments on true equality. In fact, we see a glimpse of this prejudice in the clip from Dune. The elite members of society, the royalty, speak multiple languages. However, we, the viewing masses, educated though we may feel we are, receive simple English translations at the bottom of the screen. This for me is the real limitation to joy, and it is also a stark warning about losing hold of our democratic institutions. 
one question I ask, is there true democracy in a monolingual world? Rosemary Salomon again speaks to this point, quote, a core strategy of colonialism was to control language, which became a means of establishing truth, order, and reality. Devaluing local languages and knowledge preserved the colonial myth that these languages lack depth and complexity to function beyond everyday life. She continues further, relying on English to the exclusion of indigenous languages has been a dangerous blind spot in the developing world. Perhaps William Morris provides us with a model to imitate. Today in the face of instant translations and English only curricula, maybe we need to go back to a pre high tech time, so to speak, when reading world literature meant learning world languages. In doing this, we will likely feel less alienated, but we will definitely recover a deeper sense of joy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jonathan, for this part of our session that recovers language and community, language and democracy. My part is more centered about the individual. And I'm gonna start sharing my presentation with you. Okay. Let me open first. Okay. okay, so here we are for the language of joy. And for this part of the session, I would like to start with some exercise, with a mindful exercise that I do in almost every week in my classes. And when we move into a remote teaching where technology was the only medium to be connected where our screens were our normal way to seeing each other, I started practicing mindfulness with my students. And this week, I hear this meditation on Headspace because we are celebrating also the Black History Month. And this is a meditation inspired in Audre Lorde. And this is her, her quote, if we feel deeply, as we encourage all ourselves and others to feel deeply, we will. Within that feeling, once we recognize that we can feel deeply, we can love deeply, we can feel joy, then we will demand that all parts of our lives produce that kind of joy. And if they do not, we will ask, why don't they? And is the asking that will lead us inevitable to our change. Joy is part of our DNA as much as sadness and sorrow. And as humans, we can experience a big array of emotion. We can recognize joy in everyday life. For example, we can recognize joy in the first hour of sunrise when the colors are painting the mountains or in our first coffee or the warm of our pet or the hand of a friend over our shoulders. But we can also recognize the heaviness that comes just with the action of existing in a deeply damaged planet and the injustice around the economic system. Recognizing our personal struggles is critical to situate our world, to situate us in the world. Existing as a woman, as a Latina, as an immigrant, as a Spanish speaker is very different than existing as a gay man in Georgia, for example or as a Native American in Colorado. 
Recognizing our particularities, especially during this pandemic, can make difficult to connect with joy. I see you and I feel you. So let's take a moment to give us ourselves the permission to cultivate joy for these few minutes. And let's be aware for those brief moments of joy. So now I'm gonna ask you, those who are sharing the screen with us today, to sit in our superficial seated, yeah, on our, on our chair and our bench, and let's align our shoulders with our hips, and let's put our hands on our legs, and let's close the eyes for a few moments. And let's try to think on that simple, brief moment of our day that bring us joy. And let's start breathing normally connecting with the context of the room in which we are. Maybe we can pay attention to the temperature or some noise that is outside or the texture or of, of our clothes. And Let's inhale, feeling the movement of the air in our bodies and exhale. And let's just scan the current feeling of our body. Know how it felt in the morning or how it's supposed to feel but how, let's just take note, a note in how we are feeling right now. Not making any judgment or any plans, just connecting with the feelings or the sensations that our body is giving us. Let's just start in the top of our heads and go down to our necks, paying attention to the shoulders, maybe feeling that the right shoulder, it's feeling different from the right, paying attention to our hands, and we can even move our fingers to let our body know that we are here. And we keep putting our attention in our torso, in the hips, And then going through our legs, our feet, our foot, our right foot, and then our left foot. And just keeping our focus in how our body feels right now. maybe feels comfortable or uncomfortable, or maybe we don't feel anything and that is okay. Feeling neutral is okay. And let's take a last 
deep breath from the point of our toes to the end of our last hair and the head. Now that we have been paying attention to the inside, let's give our mind a break. Let's take just two or three seconds with no task, no focusing on anything. And if we want to think, we let the mind think. And now we pay attention again to the body and we start feeling the chair, our wave, and all the things that are happening around us. The temperature, the noise. And we come back to this idea, to the beginning of our meditation, the idea of joy. And now in your own time, let's just start opening our eyes little by little to be back again. And why doing this exercise during a session of 50 minutes? Well, this is very important because naming our emotions and perceptions help us to calm down and regulate our nervous system. Naming calls presence to the here now. And now I'm gonna start reading my, my paper. So I'm gonna start looking at, at my right. So yes, of course, that in such an unequal world in which 100% of the population is richer than the 50% of the other world's population, and inversely, that 1% is responsible of the 50% of emissions, of contamination compared with emissions of the most vulnerable half of the population. It's very difficult to find spaces of joy. So celebrating the dissidents, connecting with empathy with the other and being happy. It's actually a sign of resistance. Being also aware of our privilege and our pending struggles, I see it as a revolutionary act. It is very common to confuse these words, joy, happiness, and pleasure. And other Lord keeps telling us that the sharing of joy, whether physical, emotional, psych, physic, or intellectual, forms a bridge between the shares, shares, which can be the basis for understanding much of what is not shared between them and lessens the threat of their difference. And this is very important because this is exactly what happens in every language classroom. This is what we do in the Department of Languages, Literatures and Department and, uh, and, and Cultures Department. We create bridges with our students. That's our job as, a teacher, as teachers. As I said, these three words have been confused and confused and sometimes we use it as a synonym. Since Aristotle, happiness has been usefully thought as a consistent of at least two aspects, hedonia, pleasure, and eudaimonia, a life well lived. In contemporary psychology, these aspects are usually referred to as pleasure and meaning. And positive psychologists have recently proposed a third part, a distinct component of engagement related to feelings of commitment and participation in life. So joy needs meaningful, needs engagement, right? So what they have discovered is, is 
that our ability to be alert, to overcome dangers, has been one of the reasons for the evolution in the human being. And in fact, and this is a quote, neural mechanisms for generating effective reactions are present and similar in most mammalian brains and thus appear to have been selected for and conserved across a species. Indeed, both positive affect and negative effect are recognized today as having adaptive functions. And positive effect, in particular, has consequences in daily life for planning and building cognitive and emotional resources. This is by Frederickson et al. from 2008. So what we learn here, and I was doing research, of course, for this presentation, is that a lot of the regions in our brain that get, get light when we experience pleasures, like the fundamental pleasures of food or the consensual sexual interactions are very similar to the pleasures of reading, of listening to music, and even opioids. Like drugs also register in the prefrontal cortex of our brain. That also gives a lot of information about, about addiction, why, why a people sick with an addiction cannot make like a conscious a choice of a stop the the consumption, but there also it's just, it's another there is another important piece of information that for building pleasure like a sustained joy we need we need meaning yes so this is very important and here I presented another resource and this is a book by Mark Brackett the permission to feel. By the late uh, 90s, emotional intelligence finally had achieved parity with the other forms of intelligence. Neuroscientists, psychologists, and intelligence researchers came to agree that emotions and cognition work hand in hand to perform sophisticated information processing. So when we are in a classroom, we are not only with our students, we are there with all their emotions and all our emotions. And he find that are basically five areas where feelings matter the most. And the first one is attention. Our emotional state determines where we direct our attention, what we remember and what we learn. Second, decision-making. When we are in the grip of any strong emotion, such as anger or sadness, but also elation or joy, we perceive the world differently. And the, and the choices we make at the moment are influenced for better or for worse. Also, emotions, of course, interact with social relations. What we feel and how we interpret other people's feeling send signals to approach or avoid, to affiliate with someone or distance ourselves, to reward or punish. Fourth, health. Positive and negative emotion cause different psychological reactions within our bodies. And the fifth, creativity, effectiveness, and performance. In order to achieve big goals, get good grades, and thrive in our collaboration at work, we have to use our emotions as thought they were tools. So joy is an important part of our classrooms. The available evidence suggests that brain mechanisms involve in fundamental pleasures, yes, are also involved in learning. So the prefrontal cortex, it's a bridging, it's a bridge between pleasure and meaning. For that reason, when the pandemic hit and everything started changing, 
yeah. Teaching, yes, became also a, a, a place of uncertainty and creativity. And the question changed, at least for us as teachers, and instead of how to make the content accessible, we started to think about how I can create conditions for students to be present and open to this content, because we knew that the physical separation was, was also a bridge that was cut for us. So then we start needing to be creative. And in my regard, I started using mindfulness and I'm sharing here the resources from Colorado State University, the CSU Center for Mindfulness. But I also understood that I needed to put on the table the difficult emotions that we were experiencing. And language and literature were the special bridge to create those examples. For, for example, Sor Juana, the 17th nun of Nueva España, currently Mexico, who was in the convent for 17 years because she chose to be in the convent and she was the most edited woman a philosopher, a theologist, a poet, a thinker. So we start finding bridges of empathy of our own isolation. So this is very important because creating connection is also part of our teaching labor. Also finding new ways of pleasure to name different forms to find our connection is important. Can you imagine that just less than two centuries ago, women were not allowed in the universities? So for example, writing or reading, those were activities that were happening in the private lives, but they were not really connected as meaningful, public and active actions. So our idea of joy in the language classroom is precisely that, connecting and creating forms of connection. And sometimes in this capitalistic world, we're so used to talk about products, to, to talk about goals, to talk about solving problems. But the reality is that as a human beings, we are built with this, with this powerful emotion that is joy and creativity. And I wanted to come back to that. And for that reason, the Department of Language, Literatures and Culture supported this initiative to create a podcast in Spanish. A podcast that the only objective was to bring joy to our listeners, to our readings. We want to grasp that powerful emotion from literature that is to create joy. And I want to close my presentation with this and to share with you the first 30 seconds of this podcast that is going to be launched at the end of February. Bienvenidos. Soy María Inés Canto. Los, las y les saludo desde el Departamento de Lenguas, Literaturas y Culturas de CSU. El primer episodio dedicado a Cristina Peri Rossi. Que lo disfruten. Empezamos. Cristina Peri Rossi, nativa de Montevideo, Uruguay, nació el 12 de noviembre de 1941. Su padre tuvo una presencia intermitente en la casa familiar y a los cinco años creyó, por unas horas, que las mujeres éramos inmortales, así que su madre no moriría nunca. La aclaración le bastó para entender que las mujeres estábamos encerradas en el lenguaje. Thank you so much for this opportunity. And we are concluding our session right now and we are open to questions and comments.
And Mighty here is, a, is asking, how did learning Spanish for Jonathan Carlyon and English for Maria Inés bring joy to our lives? What role has this joy played in your life since you, you, you became bilingual? So I guess the first question is for you, Jonathan. Well, in my case, I learned Spanish as a, um, you know, in primary and secondary school. And I wasn't intending to do anything except just enjoy knowing the language. Uh, but I uh, went off to study music at uh, a school in New York and ended up meeting my wife from Peru with whom I spoke only Spanish. And so I would say that if I hadn't had the language, I wouldn't have uh, married the person I married and um, experienced the joy that I've experienced in life. So. Uh, and that's not even getting to the part where I went in to get a you know PhD in Spanish. So <laughs> it's been immensely uh, significant in terms of bringing joy to my life. Thank you, Jonathan. For me, uh, being bilingual, I I must say that I became a trilingual person when I was 33, and it was with Portuguese. I'm not gonna speak about my experience with English. Well, I will speak a little bit, but for me, it was really impressive that a language could open a different set, actually, a different array of emotions in, in, within myself. And I was very old. I was 33. I was studying the PhD in California, and I discovered Portuguese. And what Portuguese makes me feel is something that I cannot find in my uh, maternal language, in Spanish or in English. It's just, it's a type of tenderness that only makes sense when I'm reading or listening to music in Portuguese. And also now in English, I'm in love in English and I will be married in English. So of course, as Jonathan, it has been also a place to create a, not only a connection within myself, but also a connection to the potence of creating a family. So it's, it's very powerful for me. Jonathan, do you want to read the next questions? The next question is, what is, a, what is the podcast called and will it feature other languages too? It's just for you. <laughs> okay, yeah, I just shared the first chapter of, of this podcast that uh, Jonathan encouraged me to, to start exploring and, and create. And the first uh, season of this podcast is uh, dedicated to women uh, writers because I, as I said we have been so few years here less than two centuries that I think we we need that that space and we're hoping that this podcast can be also uh, performing in different languages this is our first uh, experiment so we hope that by next year we we could have more notice about that and Maria Ines, another question for you from the chat. Um, for teachers who instruct in other countries, how would you recommend discussing things like mindfulness? And this, per this person goes on to say, I know that the US um, has moved towards this understanding of the importance of emotional intelligence. In other cultures, this isn't as valued. So what would be your approach for other learning environments abroad? Okay. Mm -mm. Well, we, we, we should be more specific about other cultures because now, of course, we are uh, we're borrowing the mindfulness scheme from, from Buddhism. That's, that's the reality. It comes from a religion that could be experienced from, from every of us. And that doesn't mean that we need to attach a spiritual idea. It's just this beautiful learning of being present in, in the here and now. And for example, I think we need to learn about other different cultures on how to approach this type of connection because when we are a student, actually, the poetry by Nessa Walcoyot, a Nahuatl poet, he was also a philosopher and he says that the, create, the, the relationship with God for him was creation, it was art. When he was creating, it was when it was the moment when he will be feeling 
more to Tlokenawake, which is, which is the name of, of Nahuatl. So, of course, we can uh, approach this connection or this presence from different experiences. And I think we need to learn more and to be more open to, to learn from other cultures, because I think we, we're going to be surprised of how other um, philosophies bring us to the present. And how would I approach these in learning environments abroad? I think as humans, we like to experiment. Also, another uh, of our big powers is curiosity. And we can introduce this to students, especially with kids. It's very easy to do that, uh, to start paying attention to simple things, to, to start creating connection. I even see in, in Mexico that some of my friends with little kids, they are practicing yoga in childcare. So I think more and more part of this uh, globalized world is gonna bring us closer to these practices. Okay. Well, thank you everyone for, for joining us for this conversation. Thank you so much to our presenters, Maria, and yes, Jonathan, we truly appreciate the powerful presentation that you shared with us this afternoon. Everyone with us uh, in attendance today, thank you so much for being here. We do hope that you will attend additional sessions as part of International Programs International Symposium. Again, as you exit the Zoom room, please, if you have a moment, uh, finish the survey that will be presented to you. We truly appreciate it. Have a wonderful day, everyone.